Thank you, Dean, uh, for that introduction. Um, I hope everyone can hear me OK. Um, I wanted to talk to you today um, a little bit about some of the research that's going on in my program here at UCI. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how we power ourselves through natural means, and then how do we power human civilization, and um, whether there are alternative ways that we can power uh, civilization than the ways that we've been using for the last century or two. So the first question that I wanted to ask you um, and you can raise your hand in the back if you can't hear me. I can uh, speak up a little bit. Um, the first question that I wanted to ask you today is how do we power ourselves? How did you get out of bed this morning and get yourselves over to this room? Glucose, right? Food. So you guys are all um, refilling the calories that you need that uh, you spent getting over into this room today, right? By eating um, this very fine breakfast provided to us by the School of Physical Sciences. And so the second question I have for you is how do we power human civilization? For the most part, yep. Horse what was that? Oh, we don't use horses anymore. Um, <laughs> over the last, uh, uh, yes. Fossil, fuel. fossil fuels. Okay, so this is most of our energy now to power human civilization comes from fossil fuels, right? These are pretty ubiquitous in our everyday life. You use it, you put it in your car to get here this morning if you drove. Um, so that's coal, oil, gas, and this has been really useful for us, and it's been able to um, get uh, human civilization progress um, very, very, very quickly in the last century or so to where it is today. And so, uh, of course, uh, using these fossil fuels has a side effect, uh, which we're becoming more and more aware of every day, and that is the increasing concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. So I don't study climate change, but I have to say that I'm very lucky to be at UCI because um, UCI has one of the top three departments in earth system science in the country. And so I work with people who study this, but basically what I'm concerned about is not only the rise, but where it comes from. And it's from our fossil fuel use, right? So here's a chemical equation, because I'm a chemist. Um, but another way to look at it is that fossil fuels, and I show coal here, but this is basically all of them, whether it's propane or natural gas or oil, is made of carbon, carbon, or carbon, hydrogen bonds, right? And so we basically combust these in oxygen, um, and what we get out is CO2, which is a byproduct. Um, you actually also get some water out, and you get energy. And really, what we care about is this energy part, right? We don't need all the other things. Um, but of course, CO2 is a byproduct of that, and that's becoming a problem um, with climate change. And so the question is, um, we do this on a very, very large scale. It's 18.5 terawatts a year. Um, so this is an average burn rate for uh, 2015. Um, I don't have a more recent number. I think they're still calculating that. But the problem is, is that if we're at 18.5 terawatts now, um, this is going up at a very rapid rate. And by 2030, as more countries uh, come online and start increasing their standard of living, we're projected to want uh, to need 28 terawatts of energy. And then by 20, uh, 50, 50 terawatts, which is you know, two and a half times the amount we have now. And so how do we balance these two effects where we want to minimize the amount of CO2 we release into the air and get this uh, chart to start moving the other direction or leveling out and maintain our standard of uh, life that we're used to and also allow other countries to um, move up to our standard of living? So the question is, where is this energy is going to come from? And so I drew here this little circle, which represents our uh, current-ish world energy consumption from 2015. This is 18.5 terawatts. And we can think about the resources that we have available to us to power human civilization. So um, the biggest one of a um, non-renewable source, so this is a total reserve um, that's available, is coal. And so at this rate, this is 830 terawatt years, right? So we have uh, coal is probably our largest uh, fossil fuel resource that is available. Um, there is also uranium in the form of nuclear energy. So there's a very, very uh, large difference in the potential um, versus uh, what we can currently access today. And that's basically uh, due to whether or not we want to recycle spent products or mine uranium from the ocean, which is technology that we don't have yet. But this, so there's a large range here, but that's sort of what's accessible to us right now. Um, there's oil, of course, is what we use in, in transportation. And then there's natural gas, which we're using more of, um, especially um, with more natural gas wells that are, are being found. So what about renewable resources of energy that aren't fossil fuels? Um, I put these two together. This is basically um, using either waves or tidal motion uh, to generate energy. And of course, um, everything on this side is annual, so things that you know, we'll get more of every year and about this quantity. There's hydroelectric, um, which is you know, a major um, source of energy in the Pacific Northwest where they have a lot of rivers. Um, geothermal, that's sort of um, wh where we are now in the potential. And biomass. Um, the number with the biomass looks 
like a pretty decent size number, but this is actually um, on the higher end says that we're using most of our arable land to grow crops for energy, which of course is a problem if we also want to grow crops for food. Um, and then there's wind, which actually has a, a fairly large potential if we were able to put that, um, those resources in. So I'm missing an important one here. Uh, can anyone guess what that one is? Solar. solar. Okay, so how much solar energy is available to on a yearly basis, right? Not just once, but yearly. 23,000 terawatts. So you may have heard this statistic that enough sunlight hits the earth in one hour to power human civilization for one year, right? It's an enormous resource. So if I were to put this on this map, that's what it would look like, right? It's easily enough to power our society. It's easy enough to accommodate um, increasing population or um, bringing uh, the rest of the world up to our standard of living, right? So this is a really great resource that we have available to us and it's available to everyone, right? And so, um, this has been really great in California that we are increasing the amount of solar capacity that we have. Um, I just got solar in my house earlier this year. Uh, we're now at about 15% uh, generated by solar utilities. Um, this is actually a trend that is being mirrored across the world. And so this is um, the worldwide growth of photovoltaics. You see it's following sort of the same type of curve. Um, and they're still sort of figuring out what the different distributions are um, in the different regions here in, in, in 2016 and 2017. But you can see the exponential growth. Um, does anyone want to take a stab at what country has the greatest solar capacity? China. China actually has the, the most megawatts of solar energy at this time. Uh, the second most, um, I think, is Japan. The third is Germany. And the US is in fourth right now for total solar capacity. Um, and the reason why this growth has been so explosive is because the cost has gone way down. right? So the cost of solar electricity in 1977 was almost $76 a watt. And now, in 2013, it's actually even lower now, it's um, 74 cents a watt. And um, you may have heard of Moore's Law, right, for semiconductors, that, and the chip um, and, and the amount of information we can keep on a chip. So the price of photovoltaics follows the, uh, the Swanson effect. Um, this is partly technology and partly economies of scale. But basically, it says that the cost of solar electricity will have every 10 years or so. And that's basically followed that trend since 19, in the late 1970s. OK. So what's the problem? Why can't we just keep adding solar? We know it's there. It's gotten really cheap. And we could just keep increasing our grid, move off fossil fuels. So there are a couple of challenges associated with increasing the share of solar um, energy into uh, human life. And so um, you know, this is my house, for example, or one of your houses if you have solar. Um, during the day, everything's great. You can power your uh, utilities and everything using the, the solar energy generated. Um, but what happens if it's cloudy? right? So then your amount of electricity um, decreases that you're generating. And, and you know, it's a question about whether or not it'll keep up with uh, your demand in your house. But let's be honest, we live in Southern California. So <laughs> it doesn't happen very often. Like we have more than our fair share of sunny days. So this is something that maybe you won't have to worry about very often if you live here. But there is something that you need to worry about that happens every day, right? If the sun goes down. And uh, we would still like to watch um, TV and use our computers and keep our food cold in our fridges at night. And so this is actually becoming one of the biggest challenges in increasing the share of solar electricity um, in, different, um, in different places. And so this article came out earlier this year um, in June, just a couple months ago in the LA Times. And basically in March, we had a couple of um, very nice sunny days, as we do. And the generation of solar electricity exceeded demand. And this was a problem because it caused a lot of grid instability, right? If you have too much load, um, then the, the power grid might fail. And so what California did was that it basically started paying Arizona and Nevada to take our electricity, right? So please take our solar electricity. We have too much, and we need to stabilize our grid. And this is actually true also in Germany, where you know the neighboring countries are quite happy that when it's very sunny in Germany, they will also pay for them to take their electricity to stabilize their grid, right? And then there's many articles. If you look at, if you look at this problem, this is becoming a, a bigger issue um, in areas that have a larger share of solar electricity. Um, another issue with solar is um, we're used to these very convenient sources of energy for transportation. Um, if we take a plane or if we drive. And so how do we use solar electricity to power transportation? So these are some of the big questions that we need to solve um, if we want to move to a totally solar economy. And so this is why last year there was an article in Forbes that say, Energy storage is um, maybe the most important technology in the world right now. We need to find a way to you know, literally save our solar energy for a rainy day um, or find a way to, to use it better in ways that we know how to use energy. And um, 
So I just wanted to, to let you know, and this is actually quite, quite exciting to me, is that California is dealing with this problem. They don't want to keep paying other states to take their electricity. And so um, earlier this year in Ontario, um, South, South Cal Edison and Tesla um, partnered up to make a giant battery facility, um, 80 megawatts. So this just opened, I think, in January or February of this year. Um, Tesla is also, you know, on top of this problem. They've come out with this power wall, which is, you know, for five grand, you can put this in your garage and it will save excess solar energy during the day and then you can use it at night. Um, and then Hawaii, um, where this actually, they encountered these grid overload problems first because they were the, the fastest adopters of solar for obvious reasons, being on an island, fossil fuels are not a natural resource, but they have lots of sun, which is why we like Hawaii. Um, they actually um, got a battery system coupled um, to a solar panel installation in Kauai, and that's just opened up earlier this year as well. But, so this is a great short-term solution, but there are some reasons why batteries may not be able to um, enable energy storage um, for, um, for all of our society. And um, part of that is because of the expense of batteries. Um, part of it is that they, as you know, with your phone, um, they do die, they have limited lifespans. And then the current best technology uses lithium, which is a limited resource. And so um, most people believe there's not enough lithium for everyone to have an electric car, for example, um, or a power wall in their house. And so there's actually one other issue with um, batteries that uh, may limit um, its uh, share in um, helping to solve these problems that we have with solar energy, and that's with energy density, right? So what is energy density? Well, energy density we can measure, so this is a graph. Energy density we can measure by kilojoules per liter, for example, by volume. So this is the, uh, a volume axis where here you have more energy density per volume and here you have more energy density by weight. And so where do ba batteries fall on this graph? So here would be something that's very energy dense by volume and by weight and here's something that's very low. So we take lithium ion batteries, which is what we have in our cell phones, um, lead acid batteries that you know, we have in our cars and supercapacitors, we find that they're actually really poor energy density. And of course, I wouldn't have drawn the axis this way if there wasn't something up here, right? Um, so I just wanted to point out that you know, they're, they're very convenient, they're commercialized, they're really great technology, which is improving all the time. But at this moment in time, they're not um, very energy dense. And so there's a reason why we actually prefer to use fossil fuels um, for our energy resources. It's because they're very, very energy dense, right? These carbon-carbon, carbon-hydrogen bonds hold a lot of energy by weight and by volume, and that's very convenient for us to use. And so the question that we have is, how do we use sunlight to form similar energy-dense chemical bonds? It seems like kind of a challenge. You're basically converting between two types of energy, sort of electrical energy from solar panels and chemical energy in the form of chemical bonds. But this, act, this process actually happens on an enormous scale every single day. Does anyone want to take a stab at what that is? <laughs> the dean can't answer. Come on. <laughs> um, OK. So you're correct. The answer is photosynthesis. Um, this happens on a very large scale and it does exactly that. So this is the chemical equation. It takes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, it takes water, right? Um, it takes sunlight and it generates fuel, right? So basically plants are able to take sunlight and air and water and turn them into these energy rich sources um, that they can use to grow and that we can use as well. And so I think this is quite fascinating. This is an enormous scale, it's 130 terawatts a year is what they estimate that happens in photosynthesis. Um, something else that I learned recently that I thought was quite interesting was this. Um, I, I've looked at this graph probably for more than a decade, and I didn't notice until someone pointed out to me, but there's a seasonal variation, right? So it's, there's a background with our contribution from fossil fuel, so it's going up on average, but every year it goes up and down and up and down and up and down. And so I was like, well, what is that? <laughs> well, it turns out that photosynthesis is most active in the spring and the summer. And so when photosynthesis is very active in the spring and summer, the CO2 level drops, and then during the winter, it rises again. Um, and of course, then you're saying, well, come on, it's spring and summer on the planet, so everywhere, right? I mean, you know, the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. Well, it turns out that most photosynthesis happens in the northern hemisphere. So when it's spring and summer there, the CO2 level drops, and then when it's winter in the northern hemisphere, it rises again. So there's this sort of background um, along with our fossil fuel use. And so I, I like to think of this as the plants on the earth breathing, right, which is essentially what they're doing as they grow and, and, they, and they go dormant. So um, if we go back to our question in the very beginning, how do we power ourselves? Um, you can see that, you know, with plant-based products, uh, these are the fruits of photosynthesis, right? These vegetables and leafy, um, leafy greens um, and fruit. But when you think about it, all the animal products that we use, whether it's meat or milk or something, 
they all came from animals that got their energy from eating plants, which got their energy from photosynthesis. And so really, we are all solar powered, right? So all of, all of our humanity life on this planet is powered by the sun, right? It's all powered by photosynthesis, which then you know, feeds off of that and then basically uses the power itself. And so it's kind of a, a compelling thought to think about is that um, we know plants, oh, sorry, I wanted to, to talk briefly about, um, uh, we know plants can do this and they can make these, these very nice energy sources. So how do these energy sources uh, compare on our graph? So if we look back at our graph with all the different um, fossil fuels and, and the batteries, uh, we see that um, plants, they also make chemical fuels. Uh, glucose and sugars are not quite as energy dense as fossil fuels, but of course, uh, vegetable oil, which is you know, how plants can store a lot of energy, is an extremely ener energy dense. And uh, body fat, which is what we use you know, to, to store our extra energy, also extremely dense. And so it's kind of a neat thing to think about. Um, what was sort of interesting to me when I think about parallels between um, civilization and, um, and life is, you know, we can fly a plane from here to Sydney, which is, when you think about it, a pretty incredible feat without refueling, right? So a plane when it takes off is 600,000 pounds. Um, half of that's fuel, but it basically can run off of that 300,000 pounds of fuel for 15 hours. And that's an enormous amount of energy, right? And the only other thing that can fly 7,000 miles without a refuel, without getting more energy, is this bird that migrates from Alaska to New Zealand every year. And what's the fuel that it uses? It uses body fat, right? And so basically, you know, we and nature have found ways to basically use these very energy dense um, sources of, um, these very energy dense sources um, to power ourselves in transportation. And, and they're very convenient for this reason. Um, so I hope I've convinced you that, you know, this is a, obviously a very important process that powers humanity. Um, and, and life on this planet. So can we basically replicate this process in order to make fuel that we can use to power human civilization? And what would that look like? Um, so um, I work in a field called artificial photosynthesis. And basically the idea is that we will replicate this process on this side with a synthetic system, right? So we know how to capture light very, very effectively. We can use solar panels. Um, that is. Um, commercialized technology that's actually getting better all the time because more research is being done on it. And then we can couple that to an electrolyzer, which can basically take water just like uh, photosynthesis does, split it, make O2, and then we can use the protons and electrons for that process to either make hydrogen directly, which we can use as a fuel, or it can take CO2 and turn that into carbon-based fuels. Right? So how do we replicate this process? Well, there's a lot of different components on this, and there's a lot of research being done on each component. But the part that we work on in my lab at UCI, um, uh, this, this is called solar fuels, is the product from this. And the part that we work on here at UCI is, um, is the catalyst that run these reactions, right? So we need catalysts for these reactions that happen that I'm drawing right here. Um, and I'll talk to you a little bit about what a catalyst is and what we're looking for in a good catalyst. So one way that you can describe a catalyst is it's something that helps accelerate a reaction. That's probably what you learn in, um, chemistry in high school, you know. Um, and so I like to think about it as hiking because I like to do this in my free time. And so if you think about your products, uh, your reactants being here, this is two protons and two electrons for the simplest fuel. And we want to get over here. And if we have to take this route, which is basically summiting this peak to get from here to here, this would be an uncatalyzed reaction. It would be quite slow. And if we wanted to speed this reaction up, if we wanted to get to here to here faster, we can, for example, find a way over a pass. So this will be a catalyzed reaction. It's something that we can add to the reaction that will help it go that is not consumed in the reaction, right? It, the definition of a catalyst is that it's not it's self-consumed, but it basically helps you find these ridges to basically get from A to point A to point B faster. Okay, so to talk a little bit more about hydrogen as a fuel. Um, we actually already know how to turn solar electricity into hydrogen fuel. Okay, so this is a polymer electrolyte membrane or PEM electrolyzer. This has been commercialized for a couple decades, although uh, the market is relatively small and they're quite expensive, and I'll explain why. So uh, there's a lot of things going on in this picture, um, but I'll just um, walk you through it. So basically, we're taking water again. We're taking the protons and electrons from water, and we're um, splitting it, and then we're generating O2. So O2 is a byproduct that uh, we're not really looking for. We just want the protons and electrons from the water. And then the protons and electrons move over to the other side and basically make H2, which we do want. This is the fuel that we want. 
And then the net reaction that we basically get is we're basically turning water into fuel and oxygen just um, in a very similar fashion that photosynthesis does. So if this is already known and this is already commercialized, why aren't we just putting a bunch of these in place so that we don't have to sell Nevada and Arizona our extra energy when we generate it? And there's a good reason for that and a reason why it's not very widespread. And it's because the catalyst that does this side is iridium. If you're not a chemist, you may not know much about iridium, but I can tell you that it's 40 times rarer than gold. Right? This is a very, very rare metal. Uh, there's uh, not very much of it, and as a result, it's very expensive. Um, the catalyst on this side that's most commonly used in chemical electrolyzers is platinum. Right? So platinum you're probably familiar with because it's used in jewelry, like my wedding ring. And, um, and that's uh, also quite expensive. And so basically, we know how to do this reaction. Uh, we've actually known for a long time how to do this reaction, but we don't know how to do it cheaply, right? So these are, these are too expensive. And so we also can think about how nature manages to run these reactions. And one of the things that we know about biology is that when nature wants to run reactions, it can't use expensive metals, right? Nature can't use platinum to run its reactions, because if it did, it would just die, because it would it'd be like, where is it? There's not enough, right? I mean, we think about what we use, the metals that we use in our body to do um, reactions or, or, or just function. Um, you know, we use things like iron, right, in our blood and, and zinc and all these things that are very common. And so we think about how nature runs this reaction, which is the water oxidation reaction. It doesn't use iridium. So this is a, a picture of the photosystem two dimer. And if you go to where the action happens, um, this is called the oxygen evolving complex, right? So this is where the actual um, water oxidation um, happens to make O2. And the metals that we find here are calcium, which is about a penny an ounce, and manganese, which is about six cents an ounce, right? So this is really cheap stuff. It's able to accomplish this chemistry that as humans, we only know how to do with iridium or know how to do well with iridium. If we think about the other reaction, which is the uh, generation of hydrogen, this is not a photosynthetic reaction, right? Because photosynthesis fixes carbon. But this does happen in nature. It happens in these anaerobes. And the enzyme they use is called hydrogenase. And this enzyme, if we peek into that active site to see where all the action's happening, we said that they use iron, right? So iron is one of the cheapest metals. Um, this is, uh, you may not be able to see this in the back, but this is 0.2 cents an ounce. So when I looked up the price of iron, it was given in dollars per ton, right? So when I did the calculation, it's you know uh, a fifth of a cent per ounce. So that's a that's a really good deal, right? If you want to be able to do this reaction with with a cheap metal like this. And so the question is, what lessons can we learn from nature so that we can also use cheap metals to do this kind of chemistry? And so the first level, the first lesson that we can learn is level the energy landscape. So what does this mean? It basically means that if this is the uncatalyzed reaction, we want to find a be better way to get from point A to point B. Um, this would also be a catalyzed reaction, but you can see here that we're going up this ridge, and then we're going down this valley, and up this ridge again, and back down again. Um, and that's fairly inefficient as well. What we could do instead is try to take a more direct route, right? And so this is a, basically a more efficiently catalyzed reaction. And what we can think about when we think about these landscapes is that every time we go over a ridge or into a valley, we're making or breaking a bond. So if we can understand what those bond energies are, then we can ba basically find ways to more efficiently make and break these bonds so that we don't have to climb over ridges or go into valleys that we have to then get out of. So the way that we did that was um, we, we first looked at this hydrogen production reaction. Um, and then we essentially made this nickel compound. So this is not platinum, it's nickel. Um, and, and examined whether, um, how well it does this reaction. And some things that were very exciting about this um, was that it catalyzes the generation of hydrogen with good efficiency. Right? So this is, again, um, a cheaper metal than platinum. It functions at pH 1 and is highly stable. So why is that important that it functions at pH 1? Uh, well, in the end, we would like to integrate uh, the materials that we make into devices. And currently, in PEM electrolyzers, the best me membrane that's available here, so this component, um, works best at pH 0 or 1. And so in order to be compatible with the other components, we need to basically tailor our catalyst to work under the same conditions. But our framework of sort of understanding bond making and breaking events um, is actually very useful because it allows us to basically tailor make catalysts for a variety of different conditions, which is important because you know we have all these components that need to work together, and so we sort of have to make our catalyst compatible with the other components in our device. Another lesson that we can learn from nature is proton management. Um, so our reactions require electrons, but they also require protons. And so electrons are very light and speedy, and they don't usually slow the reaction down. But protons are more problematic. So they're 1,500 times heavier about, and they usually slow the reaction down. So the difference between moving an electron and a proton is like the difference between moving a two liter bottle of water and a sedan, right? So these are quite different. Um, 
Oh, we're in Orange County, so I'll put that. <laughs> uh, so, so moving this bottle of water and this sedan. And so if we go back to our energy landscape, say we figured out you know, this nice smooth pass, but we need to get this car from here to here. Um, so what's the best way to move the car from here to here? Well, we build a road, right? That will, make it, that will help us move our proton along faster if we can build a road for it. So how does nature build a road for protons? So if you go back to this uh, picture that I showed earlier of the oxygen evolving complex, uh, where the oxidation of water has to generate O2, um, you'll notice here among the manganese and the calcium that are used in the exocyte, there's a lot of these red lines. Each of those red lines is a hydrogen bond. And essentially what that does is it serves as basically pathways, low energy pathways for the protons to move. Um, and essentially what we do in our lab is we try to replicate this microenvironment in synthetic scaffolds. Um, so this is a cobalt compound where you can see with the red lines, um, the hydrogen bonds that exist in the compound. Um, it may be hard to see because this is two dimensional. So I have a little uh, video of it rotating. So the red and the white molecules are water. And then we can tell by structural analysis um, that they're hydrogen bound to these nitrogens that are sort of poised over them. And so we can see this internal uh, hydrogen bond um, environment that basically replicates what we would find in an enzyme. So that was very exciting. And then the other way that we can help build a road for protons is by using what we call proton relays. And so if we go back to the active site of the iron hydrogenase that I showed you earlier, we can see here that this nitrogen holds this proton right next to the proton that's attached to this iron. Right? So basically, it's poising it for reactivity. It basically is making it very accessible. And so in some of the work I did before I came to UCI, we made this molecule. And this molecule is, is also a nickel molecule that catalyzes the production of hydrogen very fast. In fact, in some cases, as fast as the enzyme, which is something that had never been done before. And the way that we were able to do this by basically mimicking that same kind of microenvironment around the synthetic compound in order to mimic the activity that we see in the enzymes. So that's another lesson that we can learn from nature. Um, I'll just talk briefly about two projects, other projects in my lab. And one of them um, involves other lessons that we can learn from nature. So, so far, I've mostly talked about the oxidation of wa uh, water to oxygen and the reduction of protons to make hydrogen. But we're also interested in recycling CO2 into fuels. So the problem with that is that CO2 is relatively unreactive. Um, and so when we look to nature and see how nature does that, um, this reaction is the two electron reduction of uh, carbon dioxide into carbon monoxide. And this is done in nature with the um, nickel carbon monoxide dehydrogenase. And what I'm showing here is the active site. And so in the active site, you can again see nickel and iron, right? These sheet metals that come um, up and up again in nature, right? Nature has to use sheet metals. And so basically, the way nature is able to activate this very unreactive molecule is by using these two metals in a cooperative fashion, right? They basically use two to bind it and activate it to break that carbon oxygen bond. And so we basically. Um, make synthetic mimics of this in our lab, where we basically also try to put two metals next to each other. In this case, these are first, uh, first group metals, first column metals, um, and put them next to another metal to see whether we can cooperatively activate CO2. And this basically lowers the energy of doing it. It's basically stealing the secret from nature on how to activate this very otherwise very unreactive molecule. So you might be asking, um, why are we interested in making carbon monoxide? It's, uh, most of us probably have. Uh, detectors for carbon monoxide in our home. It's kind of a dangerous gas. It's toxic. And I'll tell you the reason why. Um, most of you maybe have heard um, the gas to liquids technology. It's basically turning coal into liquid fuels. Um, this is very popular in countries with lots of coal, but not a lot of petroleum resources, um, like South Africa. So the technology they use is called Fisher Trope. Um, this has been around for 100 years as well. It's a large industrialized process now. And basically, they take hydrogen, which comes from steam reforming of fossil fuels, and carbon monoxide, which comes from coal that's been processed, and they're able to turn that into liquid fuels, like diesel. And so our idea is that it's very hard to do some of the very complex reactions of turning CO2 into liquid fuels directly. But if we can get renewable hydrogen and renewable carbon monoxide from non-fossil fuel sources, then we can access fuels that we're used to using and are currently compatible with our energy technology um, as of today, right, is, is diesel fuels and things like that. And so that's one of the reasons why we're interested in carbon monoxide, not as a fuel itself, but as a precursor to generate um, fuels that we're used to using, using known technology. Another thing that we're interested in is how do we capture and concentrate CO2? So most of you have probably heard of clean coal. And some of you may know that clean coal sort of has a bad name um, environmentally. So I'll explain a little bit how clean coal works. Um, so cl this is how uh, clean coal is essentially capturing the carbon dioxide that comes from the exhaust 
of a coal plant and then concentrating it and then hopefully sequestering it so that it doesn't go into the atmosphere. So the way that it works is it basically takes a molecule, which I'll call here a capture agent, that binds CO2 very, very tightly. So CO2 is um, shown here in, as these blue balls and then uh, uh, these orange ones are the capture agent. And so the capture agent grabs the carbon dioxide um, and then it basically goes into a, a separator unit. Um, in this case, it's using heat to separate the CO2 and the capture agent. And then the concentrated CO2 goes out this way. And then you can recycle the capture agent back again. And then, of course, what comes out this way is all uh, gases that have been stripped of CO2. So the reason why this has such a bad name um, is partly because of the technology that's being used now. So they use a thermal cycle to capture the CO2. And thermal cycles are inherently inefficient. It's, it's sort of carnal related why they're inefficient. Um, so the maximum theoretical efficiency you can get is about 50% of what it could be just by thermodynamics um, because you're using heat. The actual efficiency is actually much, much, much worse. It's 5%. Um, and so what that basically means um, in current clean coal technology is that for every ton of coal that you burn, you need to burn another half a ton to get the energy to capture the CO2 from the first ton. Right? So it's incredibly inefficient. And this is why a lot of environmentalists say that you know, to stop calling it clean coal, it's not very clean. Um, and it's true that they are trying to improve this technology, but there are some ways that in which it's inherently inefficient. And on top of that, um, it's only feasible for separating CO2 from coal plant emissions, which is 5 to 10% CO2, um, also known as flue gas. And from our purposes, we're also interested in separating from air um, if we want to recycle CO2 to use it as a fuel. And so we're actually using, uh, we, we were thinking, is there a better way to do this? And we're actually using electrochemical separation. So basically what this is, is that instead of using heat to put CO2 on and off or a capture agent, we're using an electron, right? So basically, if you add an electron to this molecule, it binds CO2 very tightly. If we then take it away, it releases it. And this is actually, um, could be, has, has, a, has a lot of potential because it can approach 100% efficiency. Um, you can also, uh, it's also possible to capture CO2, CO2 from air using this technology. And the most important thing is that we're not just dreaming up magical molecules that can you know, have this capability. There are actually molecules that exist that when you add an electron can capture CO2 from near air concentrations and then release it when we take the electron away. The catch is, is that those molecules right now also react with O2. Like I said in the beginning, CO2 is more rea uh, less reactive, uh, is not very reactive at all, and oxygen, of course, is much more reactive. And so any, t any gas mixture that we would want to separate CO2 from is going to have oxygen in. So what we're working on now is finding ways to basically separate the two reactivities out so that we can make capture agents that will capture the CO2 with the properties that we want but are stable to oxygen. Um, so I, I gave you a quick summary of the research that's um, going on in my lab um, right now, but I wanted to talk uh, about a few more things before you know I'm done today. Um, and one of them is why I came to UCI to work. And I wanted to talk about this because I think it's important um, about the culture of the School of Physical Sciences. Um, so I got really excited about working on renewable energy about 20 years ago when I did an internship, um, when I was an undergraduate at the, the National Renewable Energy Lab. And that basically motivated me and, and made me think, you know, if I want to be a scientist and I really want to work on problems that matter. And I really want to work on problems that matter for energy and the environment. And when I came here four years ago, um, one of the things that attracted me to UCI, um, I was working at Caltech at the time, was this legacy that we have in our department. Um, you know, Sherry Rowland was the founder and he won the Nobel Prize um, for um, his important discoveries on the effect of CFCs and ozone. And I feel like this legacy is still present in the department where we really try to work on um, problems that matter to society. And the other thing that's very attractive about working here is that, you know, I was working on artificial photosynthesis before, but one thing that's very uh, difficult about this challenge is that, you know, we work on this side, but there's also this side, and then there's the membrane, and then there's a condition, uh, and, then, and then there's also the device physics, right, and, and engineering. So it's extremely interdisciplinary. And it's very useful to be able to talk to people who work on the other components because they basically make, they help guide the science that we do and make what we do better. And so um, we're very lucky to have here um, not only a lot of people who work in the different components of the different areas in our de own department in engineering, um, but we have a center as well that basically helps support this research and, and keeps us talking to each other um, so that we can move this forward more quickly. Um, there's, uh, speaking of teams, I wanted to introduce you to my own team. Um, so if you're in the Yang group, can you stand up? I know I'm embarrassing you. This is what you do to our students. Um, so uh, these are my, my research students. Uh, 
postdoctoral scholars and, and undergraduates that are basically in the lab every day, uh, moving the things I talked about uh, forward, um, and, and several alumni from our group that we have gone on to do uh, pretty incredible things um, in their own right. Um, a lot of undergraduates off to graduate programs and, and getting their own PhDs, and then uh, postdocs that are off uh, teaching and working in industry. Um, I'd also like to thank um, the funding agencies. Um, so the F School of Physical Sciences gave me my start here. Um, but since then, uh, we've had some foundational support um, that have helped us get some high-risk projects off the ground um, so that we can establish them. Um, we've also relied very heavily on federal funding. Um, so both the National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy. Um, and in this, in this sense, I would really like to thank you as taxpayers because you know, our program would not exist if it weren't for federal funding like this. Um, and they help pay for all the students, pay for all our supplies, and pay to keep moving this research forward. So thank you also for um, supporting our program through the federal government. Um, and I, I'm looking, and I'm look, I have a few minutes, so I wanted to share one last thought with you. Um, and I know I've been saying that for a few slides now, but this for real is the last slide. Um, I wanted to share an article that I read recently. Um, and it's from this uh, Italian photochemist. And I can read it for you because I know it's a lot. So it says, if our black and nervous civilization based on coal shall be followed by a quieter civilization based on the utilization of solar energy, that will not be harmful to progress and to human happiness. He further says, there will spring up industrial colonies without smoke, and without smoke snacks. Forests of glass tubes will extend over the plains. Inside of these will take place the photochemical processes that hitherto have been the guarded secrets of plants. And if in a distant future the supply of coal becomes completely exhausted, civilization will not be checked. For that life and civilization will continue as long as the sun shines. So I wanted to point something out, is that I intentionally didn't give the full date here. So it says September 12. So this was actually written in September 1912 by a very forward-thinking photochemist, which is incredible. So he had this vision 100 years ago that, and, and at the time, he wasn't worried about climate change. He was worried about the pollution you know, from coal that was um, you know, blackening his city. And he basically was like, you know, there is a better way. right? And at the time, they understood about photosynthesis to say, you know, this powers our planet, powers all of life. Why can't we use it to power ourselves? Why are we digging things on the ground that then pollute our air? And so he had this vision that if we could replicate this process, that we can use artificial photosynthesis to power civilization the way that we use to power ourselves. And I think now we're actually at a stage where we understand enough about you know, the chemistry and the physics and the biology to actually achieve this goal. And so you know, this is what we're working on right now, not just me, but a whole community of scientists on an international level. So I hope I inspired you to think a little bit more about this today um, and learn about it. And uh, I appreciate your attention, and I'm happy to answer questions. So um, it depends on cost, like many things, right? And so, um, like I said, a lot of our best catalysts are precious metal catalysts at this point. Um, I think with non-precious metal catalysts, we can achieve 10%. And so photosynthesis is actually, um, um, you know, which is sort of the motivation behind biomass, is only 1% efficient. So we already can do 10 times better than photosynthesis in terms of sunlight to chemical bonds. But if we don't worry about cost, I believe we can achieve something like 30%. Um, but that's with, obviously, materials that we need to find cheaper replacements for. So um, generating that very energetic immediate, intermediate was what will cost you the energy, right? So every time you have to climb anything, you will have to expend energy to do that. Um, so um, I don't know, depending on how wild you guys were when you were kids, I don't know if you ever put sodium in water or uh, if you know what happens when you put an alkali metal in water. So it gets really, really hot and it makes H2 and then it makes a fire, right? So if you're daring, you can do this. Um, and so that's a way of making H2, right, from water. But that, all that heat that you generate um, is wasted energy. And so if we wanted to turn that into a catalyst, we'd have to turn all those sodium or lithium ions back into the metal metallic form, and that's enormous cost of energy. So basically, every time you have to go up, you're basically wasting energy. And every time you go down, you release energy that's, you know, that's not being used to form your, your chemical bond. I don't, I'm happy to talk to you about it more as well. So there's two parts of that question. Is that one, um, I think you're talking about batteries and electrical storage. 
And right now, batteries are a commercialized technology, and they can basically uh, take up energy and give it back at, at, very, at very high efficiency, right? which it loses over time as it cycles. So that's definitely true. Batteries are currently the most advanced technology for energy storage. Um, the second thing um, that you said um, about taking CO2 to the atmosphere. So the amount of energy it would take to take CO2 out of the atmosphere is basically a couple of kilojoules per mole, which is tiny. So if we were to go at perfect efficiency of turning, capturing CO2 and turning it into a fuel, it would only be 3% of the cost. Um, but of course, we have things that are 5% efficient instead of, you know, um, instead of closer to 100% efficient. So the way that I see it is that um, the energy storage problem when we go to renewable sources is going to be many components. So batteries may um, be the best solution for stationary applications where we don't care about energy density. Um, we may be willing to spend the extra energy to make fuels for things like transportation, right, where it's much more convenient. You can't buy a plane on a battery, right? There's just not enough that you can store that en much energy. So I think it will be a mix. I think there will be a portfolio of options. And so that's kind of why I believe that all these technologies should be pushed forward. And there's even solutions like pumping water uphill and then letting it come down again, you know, at night or something. There, there's lots of different ways to store energy. And I think we have to push all of these forward to see until we find the best ones or the best ones for particular applications. I used to work at JCAB, yeah. Um, it's similar. Um, so we, there are some different approaches. So they believe in integration of all the components um, into one cell. Um, and, and that's something that I don't feel like is as important because then uh, the problem with putting uh, photo absorbers into uh, these electrolyte solutions is that they corrode like many things do in salt solutions. And so if we don't worry about that and we just use electrodes that are connected by wires, then we don't have to worry. Um, we're just basically circumventing, I think, some of those issues. Now, they have other arguments that their approach is cheaper, which is possible, right? But it also prevents more challenges. So I think there are many approaches to this that we're all kind of moving the same goal, but we have different strategies to, to get there. Okay, well, thank you once again, Jenny, for a spectacular lecture.